Hello everyone, welcome to session five of LTech 651. As usual, I want to start out by talking about your most recent critical reflection, Critical Reflection 4. This week, I learned a little bit about a lot of things, from cheerleading to note-taking, from programming functions to the three branches of government. All in all, I hope you felt this was a rewarding experience, one that was enhanced by what you've been learning about, the limits and assumptions of human information processing, and how the design of multimedia instructional messages can influence how learners spend their precious cognitive resources. Not to mention how interactivity itself can be woven into multimedia experiences in ways that can enhance and or hinder the learning experience. I want to spend a little time encouraging you to reflect on H5P as a multimedia authoring platform. And one of the ways we can do that, of course, is to think about which authoring paradigm H5P aligns with. Of course, last week we learned about the structure-based paradigm, the timeline-based paradigm, the graph-based paradigm, and the script-based paradigm. And, of course, H5P is an example of a structure-based paradigm where authors can simply layer any number of discrete media objects onto a given page or canvas and then sequence those objects in a particular order. And so that's an example of the structure-based paradigm. Now, although we're going to be moving on from H5P this week, I want you to keep in mind that there are lots of different content types that you can work with in H5P. So I really encourage you to explore some of these. And I would say that the course presentation content type that we worked with this week is really kind of middle of the road. Many of the content types are quite a bit simpler than the course presentation. And there's a handful of content types such as branching scenarios, interactive books, and interactive videos that are quite a bit more sophisticated and allow you to combine various H5P content types together to create larger artifacts. So be sure to check those out if you're interested in developing more multimedia instructional messages. Now, this week, we are actually going to switch to the graph-based paradigm, and we're going to do that using Twine. And in case you're not familiar with Twine, Twine is an open-source tool for telling interactive, nonlinear stories. Now, our particular focus isn't necessarily on nonlinear stories, but as we will see, we can learn to use graph-based tools such as Twine to create really interesting interactive multimedia experiences for learners. So that's something to look forward to with Critical Reflection 5. Okay, let's move on to talk a little bit more about interactivity. In this next section, I want to talk a little bit about interactivity, which, as we read about this week, is a rather complex concept. Now, one of the things that might be helpful is to think about what learners can interact with. And early research in the late 80s and early 90s focused on different things learners can interact with. And basically, there were four main distinctions. You can have learner-to-learner -learner interactions, learner-instructor interactions, learner-content interactions, and learner-system interactions. Of course, in this class, we're making the assumption that there's a single learner interacting with content and a multimedia system. So of these four types of interactions, we're focused on learner-content and learner-system interactions. Now, with that background model, of course, we read about the integrated model of multimedia interactivity, which was proposed by Domac and colleagues. And this is a very theoretical model. And it actually, as much as I like it, I think it is a very good theoretical model. As some of you pointed out in your reflections, you felt it was a little complex. According to these authors, interactivity does not automatically create understanding. And so interactivity can be good, but it's not necessarily automatically a good thing when it comes to learning. And in the article, we learned that interactivity requires two conditions. 
there has to be at least two participants interacting. And of course, in our examples, one of the participants is the learner and the other participant is the learning environment, the multimedia system. And then another important requirement of interactivity is that the actions of these participants must include an element of reciprocity. One of the things I want to point out is reciprocity means that change occurs on both sides. The actions of one party trigger responses from the other, which lead in turn to changes in the first. Now, some authors have pointed out that reciprocity, action followed by a reaction, is not enough. You also have to have responsiveness. And responsiveness is the degree to which the reactions on both sides are related, relevant, and sustain the continuity of the interaction. In other words, the reciprocity can't be random. It has to be relevant and meaningful to one of the two parties that are interacting. I thought that was kind of an important point to emphasize. So interactivity involves reciprocity as well as responsiveness. And of course, in this article, we read that interactivity is reciprocal activity between a learner and a multimedia learning system in which the action-reaction of the learner is dependent upon the action-reaction of the system and vice versa. Now, I know many of you might have felt that this particular model is a little bit overwhelming, and I agree that it is, and it hasn't really caught on, even though theoretically, I actually think this model is quite sound, and I've even used it in some of my work that I've done. But what I wanted now is introduce you to a simpler model of interaction activity. And we could think of this as a simple two by two model of interactivity. So on one side, we have cognitive activity and we can think about cognitive activity falling along a continuum from low cognitive activity to high cognitive activity. On the other axis, we can have behavioral activity, which can either be low or high. And if we divide these dimensions up, what we end up having are four quadrants. And so in quadrant one, we might have high cognitive and high behavioral activity. In the second quadrant, we might have high cognitive but low behavioral activity. And in the third quadrant, you would have low cognitive, low behavioral activity. And in the fourth quadrant, low cognitive activity with high behavioral activity. And of course, stepping back from this, the two quadrants that we are after as designers of instructional multimedia are those top two. We want learners to be highly engaged cognitively. And maybe we want to have high levels of behavioral activity. But as we learned, behavioral activity can sometimes be superficial and it sometimes can be generative and lead to germane cognitive processing. So we have to be very careful in terms of how we design for behavioral activity. So I wanted to cover this with you because I think this is a simpler model of interactivity that many of you might benefit from knowing about. Okay, so I want to end today's video by talking a little bit about empirical studies of interactivity and learning. So you might be wondering, has research shown the benefit of interactivity in terms of learning outcomes? And the short answer is yes, when the interactivity is carefully designed. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So here's a 2004 study that asked the following question. To what extent do interactive dynamic visualizations facilitate the learning of a continuous motor skill? Now, to answer that question, these researchers designed a study that involved two knot tying videos. There was a non-interactive video and an interactive video. Now, the interactive version of the video allowed the users to control the speed of the video as well as change the direction forward and backwards of the video. And they tested these knot tying videos with 36 university students, and they had to learn how to tie four nautical knots. So what did these researchers find? Well, the results demonstrated that the dynamic visualizations with interactive features actually accelerated the process of skill acquisition. The participants who used the non-interactive videos needed substantially more time 
to acquire the necessary skills for tying the knots. And the authors concluded that participants using the interactive features use them heavily. Viewers accelerated, decelerated, stopped, reversed, or repeated parts of the videos. And they argued that this enabled them to distribute their attention and cognitive resources unevenly across the whole video. In other words, the users were using those interactive features to manage cognitive load and to really focus in on specific parts of the videos. And in return, that enabled germane processing that led to greater skill acquisition and understanding of the target skill. So that's one empirical study of interactivity and learning. Let's take a look at another one. So this is from a 2012 study at NYU. And the question the researchers asked was, how does direct manipulation of multimedia impact clinical learning of an abdominal exam procedure? And so to answer that question, they designed a study with three versions of a multimedia module. There was a watch only version. There was a click only version and a drag only version. And they tested this with 162 second year medical students. And they controlled for prior knowledge, spatial ability, and prior experience with abdominal exams. So what did the researchers find? Well, the results showed that the type of content manipulation, watch, click, or drag, influenced the clinical performance of the novice medical students. Interestingly, students in the click and drag conditions were more likely to accurately identify the patient's diagnosis. And the physical exam scores were significantly higher for the click group. So the watch group, where they had no control over the abdominal exam procedure in the multimedia module, just had to go through it. They couldn't click and control the pacing, and they couldn't drag and move things around. And for that reason, they didn't learn as well. And the authors concluded that these findings suggest that the click condition had the optimal balance of intrinsic and extraneous load and of behavioral and cognitive engagement for this content. In other words, they felt that the, the drag version, although it was high behaviorally, it wasn't necessarily helpful in terms of these students learning the material. And it was actually the click condition, which was the optimal balance of behavioral and cognitive engagement. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.